Okay, so welcome to a very different kind of Edmund J. Safra lab lecture. It's not a lecture, it's an interview, and it's not an interview with a person here, it's a person who is many miles from here, although the precise location will not be known. Um, I interview with Edward Snowden. Um, many times people say, this is a person who needs no introduction, this person needs no introduction, and he will have no direct introduction. There will be a lot of information about him that will come out through a series of questions that I'll be asking him and he'll be answering. We've taken the liberty of asking you to submit questions. I've spent more time than um, my family thinks I should have trying to integrate uh, those questions into my own set of questions. And what we'll do is be conducting the interview via Google uh, Hangout um, uh, for about the next hour at least. Um, I ask you to silence your phones. This is obviously being recorded and broadcast. Um, and uh, with no further ado, what we'll do is we'll hope the technology brings Edward Snowden to the screen. There he is, Edward Snowden. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I haven't prepared any remarks, but I think we're going to cover a lot of very critical issues and, and difficult questions that don't really have a proper answer. So uh, if there's anything uh, that, that you'd like to ask, uh, Professor, I'd invite you to begin. Great. Thank you. Um, and let's just start a little bit from the personal. Um, obviously, this room and people online are going to be filled with people who know everything there is to know about you. Um, but what I've often been struck by is the number of people who have no clear sense of who you are and what your values were as you came to work with the NSA and as you came to do the, um, the work you did by exposing the NSA. So I wonder if you just give us a sense of your own personal background, your own ideological background as it might relate to this. Well, I come from a... Uh a government family. You know, my, my, my grandfather was in the military, my father was in the military, my mother still works for the government, my sister works for the government, uh, and I worked for the government. I was a staff officer uh, for the Central Intelligence Agency. I had signed up to join the U.S. military in the wake of the uh, September 11th attacks. I actually signed up for the invasion of Iraq because I believe that fundamentally our government um, had noble intents and it did good things and it did them for the right reasons. Uh, what I was not aware of, and I've, I've grown to become a little more sophisticated in this, is that while the people in government largely are uh, exactly that, they're good people trying to do good things for the right reasons, uh, there is a culture that sort of pervades the upper levels of government, the senior officials, uh, political appointees, that have basically uh, become less accountable to the public that they serve. And because of that, we see that politics and policies uh, irrevocably, sort of irresistibly, they gravitate towards the uh, prerogatives of individuals, uh, of these officials, of an elected and unelected class of bureaucrats that can sort of degrade the quality of government that we as individuals enjoy. So as I went through my time in the, uh, the classified world, the intelligence community, as we call it, uh, and I moved from the Central Intelligence Agency to the National Security Agency. I worked on both the public sides and the private sides as a contractor working for private companies, but at a government desk in government facilities using government equipment uh, and working on government programs and taking tasking from government employees. Uh, I, I gained an increasingly concerning understanding of what happens on the broad scale, what the results of all these individual decisions uh, are. And that's generally that when decisions are made in the dark, uh, the quality of those decisions is reduced. Now, that's not to say that we need to know every decision that the government makes, you know, who's under investigation, what this particular program does, but we do have to have a general understanding of the, the policies and the powers broadly that a government claims if it's going to be using them in our name as well as being using them against us. Uh, and ultimately, uh, toward the end of my tenure at the NSA, I discovered that there were programs of mass surveillance 
that were happening beyond any possible statutory authority because these things were constitutionally prohibited. And I saw that there were, these were things that never should have happened. They were initially authorized in the Bush administration. And that administration actually was fully aware in their own classified opinions in the Inspector General's report that those programs had no statutory basis. And so we saw developments where they were trying to authorize these under the president's powers. You know, they're using Article II powers, where basically the president says, we're at war, I can do basically whatever I want. Now, that may sound like a great idea and be an important power in times of total war, in times of existential threat. But we don't have U-boats in the harbor. We don't have, you know, foreign armies marching on American soil. We haven't seen total war policies in the United States since World War II. And so we have to ask, why were these decisions being made? Why was the public not allowed to participate in the debate? And why is it that even within the separate branches of government, officials were not aware of this? Within the executive branch, you know, in the intelligence community, many of my coworkers who also had top secret clearances, high level accesses, were unaware that these things were going on. The vast majority of Congress had no idea that these programs had been instituted or were being maintained. Even those on the intelligence community, intelligence committees in both the Senate and the House were not fully briefed. Only the gang of eight, that'd be the chairs, the ranking members, and then the majority and minority leaders for both houses are briefed on so-called covert action programs and things like that, exceptionally compartmented programs. And the courts have increasingly, in the wake of the post-9-11 period, become reluctant to scrutinize any decisions or programs that were constitutionally questionable, saying that they lacked the expertise or the positioning or what it ultimately boiled down to was the political willingness to confront difficult questions to which there may or may not be right answers once they're right and wrong. So this led me to stand up and say something about it. And I worked with American journalists and American news outlets to make sure that the public had an ability to make decisions about where the lines in this program should be drawn. Many people are familiar with the story since then. It's still ongoing. The reporting continues. But the ultimate basis is that many people consider the last year's surveillance of unconstitutional activity at the NSA and so on and so forth to be ultimately about surveillance and mass surveillance. And that is a critical issue, and it's the one with which I'm most familiar, and I saw the greatest wrongdoing. However, it's important to be aware that the reality that mass surveillance illustrates is that we have agencies that are working on their own authorities, they're working on their own sort of institutional momentum to implement programs without oversight, creating these things behind closed doors without the awareness of the public, that are actually changing the boundaries of the rights that we enjoy as free people in a free society. We have lost, in many ways, the freedom to associate without judgment in the United States because of the metadata program that's really an associational tracking program. When we have everyone's call records, we know who everyone's friends are. We know who they contact. We know what they do. We know when they travel. We know where they go. We know how long they're there. There are speech implications to this. There are obviously privacy implications to this. And there is a very strong argument to be made that even if we as a society believe that these powers and authorities would be valuable, that we could not institute them through statute regardless, that they simply would be unconstitutional in any form, absent an amendment. And we see this happening and being upheld even through international laws decisions very recently. Two or three days ago, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Countering Terrorism and Protecting Human Rights delivered a report that had been in the works for, I believe, several years that found that mass surveillance programs violate the obligations of states that the United States and the United Kingdom and many of our other allies have agreed to under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, as well as, and this wasn't mentioned specifically, but the very same right that he was highlighting in this report was an obligation we had agreed to 
under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, some 50 odd years back. Uh, and that's Article 12, and that's that we all have a right to uh, privacy, to be free from unjustified, unreasonable intrusions into our lives. And we have this, of course, under our own Fourth Amendment. So when it came to my story uh, and, and how I came forward, it was not that I saw a particular program and I had an ax to grind. Um, it was that broadly I was witness to massive violations of our Constitution, that they were happening in secret and that they were happening as a result of a broad breakdown throughout the branches of government. And this is the key, because when there's a problem in a single agency, when there's a problem in a single branch, uh, we tend to be self-correcting. That's what checks and balances are for. But the question of whistleblowing, of when to stand up, is really one of, do those checks and balances still function? Can you report uh, these issues within a system to a certain branch, to a certain organization, to a certain office, and actually see uh, those abuses and those policies corrected? And in this case, uh, they were not. We saw um, that both the courts, uh, the Congress, and the executive had all failed in different, um, different portions of these, uh, these programs and protecting our rights. And I think we'll cover that in a little more detail later, but did that answer your question? Yeah, so what's striking about the position you've described both here and also in, in the interviews that have been, that you've given is how relatively limited it is for its justification of stepping forth with this kind of civil disobedience. I mean, in particular, you've said um, that the problem you had with what in fact happened is primarily the problem of democratic accountability. You said, quote, it's not my role to make that choice, the choice whether the NSA engages in those activities or not. Uh, instead, it's for the American people, quote, I don't intend to destroy those systems, but to allow the public to decide whether they should go on. So the key that you're emphasizing is that we had a, pr we had a process, we had a system of government that wasn't allowing the public to even know about the issues that the uh, NSA was engaging in. And, and that's the primary justification you have for stepping forward and obviously violating the law in order to make it public. Right, ultimately it comes down to a question of, uh, you know, people argue about what is a whistleblower. Um, I tried to raise uh, my concerns internally. Uh, they got nowhere. Other individuals who had done the same thing, whether they're Thomas Drake, uh, Bill Binney, um, Kirk Weeby, Ed Loomis, uh, Diane Rourke, uh, who even went to Congress, um, all of these individuals uh, raised similar concerns and yet the issues were not corrected, they were not addressed. And that's again because of the overclassification issues um, that have been described in the way that these processes have inevitably become more cumbersome and less effective over time to the point where they're eventually broken. I think the, the ultimate mark of uh, a whistleblower is when it comes to motivations, are they standing up? Um, to change something directly to sort of uh, have a, a partisan effect, um, sort of the deep throat thing where they're trying to you know, get their boss fired so they can move into the next job. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not whistleblowing, I think, under anyone's definition. But really it comes down to when I stepped up, it was not to dictate outcomes. And I, I think that's ultimately the, the, the mark there. It's about allowing the public a chance to participate in democratic processes in order to play their part in uh, determining the outcome. The reality is since, uh, since we saw the birth of sort of this unitary executive theory uh, in the White House and, and throughout American governance, um, the government has, the public has lost their seat at the table of government. We're being increasingly left out of critical discussions about the policies and the direction that we want to steer our society toward. They're being made in our name without our awareness and without our consent. But in a democratic republic, you know, the government draws its legitimacy from the consent of the people. And everybody who's involved in any kind of research knows that you know, consent is not meaningful if it's not informed. And that's what was lacking. So when I think about the question of, um, you know, how do you see, uh, how do you find the line, the point of justification by which you can stand up, go to the press, and this is another key distinction, is I didn't publish 
any of these materials. I've never published a single story on the NSA uh, myself. Uh, because everyone has biases, right? And even though I have an expert understanding of these programs, I've worked with them personally, I know uh, the authorities they operate under, how they're used. Uh, again, I had the ability to look at anybody's email that was being ingested under these programs. Um, whether that was intercepted domestically or overseas, I had the authorities to look at both. Um, but, uh, but I didn't try to push my agenda uh, onto the public because I don't think that would be proper. And I think many other whistleblowers do the same thing. That's why we go to the press. The press is a critical part of American society. It's a part of our constitutional system. That's why we have the First Amendment. Um, and it's really not the role of an individual such as myself to say what the public should and should not know. But by working in partnership with the free press, we can allow institutions that exist to make these sort of determinations to then sit down with the government, present their evidence for why this is in the public interest. The government can make a counter case and say why this may cause some harm that may have been missed or misunderstood. Uh, or the value of these programs misinterpreted by the, uh, by the journalists. Uh, and ultimately, we can get a decision from there. Uh, and there's a kind of accountability that's born from that uh, that's lacking when it's an individual making the decisions on their own. Okay, so, but, but in, your I, in your decision to go to the press, this is a second important difference, um, you decided not to go to the New York Times directly. Uh, you went to... Glenn Greenwald, who was a very uh, outspoken, independent member of the press, and he partnered, and you, and you went to, with Laura uh, Portrives, whose amazing film is coming out this week. Um, uh, and you went to The Guardian, um, which is obviously not the American press. I, and you had very that, critical- That's actually not correct. Uh, the Guardian has both a US branch and a UK branch. Uh, they're completely separate corporate institutions. Uh, and I went to the US Guardian. Uh, additionally, it's important to remember that while Glenn and Laura are the most uh, well-known journalists, uh, Barton Gelman uh, of the Washington Post was actually involved, and that was because there was a, uh, you know, I, I made a specific determination that it would be valuable to have sort of the D.C. institution, the hearts of our government and our press, uh, really have a role to play in this. The reason the New York Times uh, was not involved in the initial disclosures uh, was because they have an institutional history of sitting on stories of massive public importance uh, simply because the government claimed that they would not be in the public interest to know. Uh, right on the eve of uh, the 2004 elections, uh, it was discovered and revealed by a reporter James Risen uh, that the Bush administration had authorized, without statutory authority, uh, the warrantless wiretapping of everyone in the country. Uh, and that was both based on the internet and the phones, um, although I don't believe he had the internet metadata program uh, known to him at the time. Uh, and the Times, uh, I believe it was executive editor at the time, I, I could be uh, mistaken on that, uh, decided to sit on the story. It was only, uh, the Times did eventually break the story, I believe more than a year later, but that was only because the journalist who had worked on the story, uh, James Risen, who's now actually being, uh, they face contempt of court charges, they're being prosecuted. Uh, by the DOJ, uh, that journalist intended to publish a book uh, to get that information to the public regardless of the newspaper's position. Um, and ultimately, the newspaper had a, an incredible change of heart and said, hey, after all, this is in the public interest. We should publish this. And it became a massive scandal, as we all recall. Uh, and the warrantless wiretapping program, as it existed then, was ended as a result. Uh, so there is a real question, I think, uh, and the Times has, uh, they've stated that they've sort of changed their positioning, they've changed their thinking and their reasoning since then uh, about taking uh, government claims at face value. Um, but there is, a, uh, there is a real question about had that story come out uh, when it was originally discovered, which was right uh, on the eve of an election, it was about the massive violation of the American Constitution. Uh, would that not only have had a public impact, would it have had a political impact? And would we have incurred the same costs that we did in the, uh, the second term of that administration had the public had a chance to take those programs into account, those decisions into account when they cast their vote? Yeah, so part of the 
dynamic of the corruption of the political process in that particular case was a corruption of the news process where uh, the news media is not giving the public the opportunity to, to reflect on the facts that should have mattered politically. Um, in the case of the Guardian USA, I mean, what I'm trying to see whether this is something that you were sensitive to, Guardian USA uh, was quite proud of the fact that it was independent of the American government because it had no access to the American government. Gibson, the editor, put it, no one takes our calls anyway, so we literally have nothing to lose in terms of access, which gave them the, the freedom to be independent enough to stand up and very aggressively um, insist that they were going to publish the Verizon story, which was the first story that Glenn uh, succeeded in getting published, um, in a time horizon that would have been unheard of had it been even the Washington Post. Um, so once again, you can think of what is it about the institutional structure of the American newspapers um, that differentiates them. And you know, many people have commented competition in the British culture among newspapers is different, greater, even though they don't have a First Amendment protection. And in the American context, there's a club of a few of these powerful um, papers that might make it less likely for them to be aggressive against the government. Um, so was that a sense that you had when you began to think about this, or is that just something you discovered after? Uh, when, when I thought about how to, how to structure um, the, uh, to enable the journalism as best I could, uh, I have no experience with the media. You know, I'm not a journalist, I'm not an editor, I can't tell them how to run or not to run their newspaper. So I, I won't take a judgment on the, the work of this newspaper, that newspaper. But um, I will say when we look at it in terms of uh, an institutional basis, the real challenge for uh, the US media, and whether that's TV or whether that's uh, print, is that it is very institutionalized. It's very hierarchical and it's very rigid. Uh, and if one institution, you know, only the Washington Post had this story, um, they would likely be, uh, they would have a very difficult time in negotiating with the government uh, to make sure that the public did get all of the information it needed and not just the information that the government thought would be beneficial for them to know, which is what we see so, uh, so regularly today with anonymous officials, uh, you know, who are basically leaking classified information, classified programs, on a daily basis, and yet they enjoy a kind of amnesty from the White House uh, because the White House appreciates the service that they're doing for them politically. Uh, now, by allowing multiple journalistic institutions uh, access to the same material, um, you are enabling a sort of a marketplace as a contest uh, to go, all of these groups will be in regular contact with uh, the United States government, and this is true for The Guardian as well, um, the Guardian has, I, I know for a fact, I've spoken with uh, Alan Rusbridger at The Guardian, um, that uh, they have had many, 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 many conversations with the United States government and UK government and so on uh, about what information has no real public value but is truly harmful. Uh, and any information like that, you know, uh, it's, it's natural that this be excised from publication. Um, because nobody wants to cause harm to individuals, right? Nobody wants to harm uh, security. But when the government draws these lines on its own, without any accountability, without any sort of uh, court of reviews, uh, they draw the lines in a, in a way that is um, more politically motivated than publicly motivated. Uh, and that's a dangerous thing. Now, journalists, uh, right or wrong, they typically see themselves as champions of the public. And because of that, they have a motivation, they have a self-image, uh, which directs them to try to safeguard the public interest, uh, not just against their own decisions and their own proclivities and their own biases, uh, but against the government themselves. And we have to have that. You know, The work of journalism, the work of the press, is challenging the government for control of information. And we lose, when we lose that, we'll be in a much poorer society for that. And I think the last, uh, the last year's revelations are a good example of the fact that the public still does uh, recognize that this kind of reporting, this kind of adversarial investigation uh, is incredibly important to the quality of our government and the quality of our society. And that's the reason that it won the, public, uh, or the uh, Pulitzer Prize for public service that was shared by the Washington Post and The Guardian for that reporting. Yeah, so, but even, so 
even in that context, though, you um, made a pretty strong distinction between people who would leak in the context of, for example, CIA activities and people who would leak in the context of what you had done. So, so this is, again, a narrower conception of, of what you think the, the appropriate role for a whistleblower is because you had a much more uh, vi uh, visceral sense of the risks that would come out by, re by re releasing information about the CIA. Right, that, that's correct. I had access to the, the, the personnel records, the social security numbers, the names, and sometimes even the addresses of everyone in, who worked in the intelligence community. These are shared databases that someone with my clearance has had access to. Uh, because I actually had a, a level of access that was greater than typical top secret. Uh, I had what was called privileged access or privac. Uh, that means when somebody like the, uh, the director of the CIA or the NSA, uh, he wants some information, he wants some report, he can't get it himself because he doesn't know where it is. He doesn't understand these things. Um, you know, he has to ask someone, an office manager, they ask someone else. But then there are ultimately individuals who have access to everything. So if I had wanted to cause harm, if I had wanted to, you know, reveal everything, uh, certainly that was, that was possible. But as you said, when you think about public interest determinations, when you think about what we should know versus legitimate secrets, um, there is a line to be drawn. And so uh, what I tried to do was I tried to ensure that only information that would be uh, necessary for the reporting was made available to journalists working in the public interest. Um, I required that they all agree to, although, you know, there's no way I can enforce that. I required they all agree not to place any individual uh, or program at, un, uh, at to unnecessary risk not to expose them to unnecessary risk or uh, needless harm, uh, and to make sure that the only stories they published uh, were ones for which they had a clear public interest justification. Uh, and based on that, I could make sure that even though, you know, I agreed that this information was important or this information was noteworthy or this would be required on background for journalists to be able to make those determinations, and to understand not just the bad things about these programs, but the good things so they could draw an accurate conclusion, but to make sure that my biases alone were not being represented and to make sure that the public was served by removing myself from the actual determination publication process. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the nature of the harm that you're worried about. Um, I was struck, given my own uh, work, with the wonderful way in which you reuse um, the Jefferson quote. Uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald brought this out. It's a, it's a really wonderful example of the way you think about the nature of this problem. So Jefferson said, in questions of power, let no more be heard of confidence in men, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. And you would remix that by saying, let us speak no more of faith in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of cryptography. So the intuition here is that we can use physics as opposed to lawyers to enforce the understandings or the rules. Um, and that's a central conception of what you think the appropriate response to these invasive technologies is. Is that fair? Right. Uh, what we saw was back when the founders were considering how to draw the lines around our government, um, its powers, its authorities, and how to enumerate, uh, you know, what privileges it would have. Um, they, they tried very carefully to say, you know, this is within the, the, the purview of the federal government. This will be left to the states and this will be left to the public. Um, and the list of public rights should be much greater than the list of government rights. But what we see uh, inexorably, and this is not unique to the United States, and neither is the problem of mass surveillance, and that's key. Um, this is not just about the National Security Agency, and this is not just about our allies. This is also about our adversaries. The world is changing. These technologies are here. Um, we need to think about how to correct and address uh, these issues. Um, but ultimately, they tried to, uh, they tried to combat the problems of the natural corruption of power over time by creating subsets of individuals, sort of institutions within the institution, 
uh, that would compete against each other for power and privilege. And because of that, they would sort of check each other and we'd have a level of reasonableness in society. Now, what we've seen is that even, uh, even while that's a great idea and it's well intended and it's worked very well for us, um, over time, over the span of hundreds of years, uh, you still get people who, uh, they try to find the ideal move in, in game theory terms. They try to uh, reach the, uh, the Nash equilibrium where they're always acting to the maximum point of their own self-interest. And when that happens, not just as members of this institution within an institution, not just as you know, a person within a branch of government, but when they begin to view themselves as a class, a political class, the elite class, um, the value of those safeguards breaks down because they no longer see themselves as member of the public. Uh, they see themselves as member of a class, as a member of a class. Now, because of the advances and achievements we've had in terms of technology and society, we're beginning to see the dawn of a new kind of thinking around this, uh, which is what I was uh, thinking about when I discussed that. And that was not, you know, an original thought of myself. Um, this is something that uh, many people in the cypherpunk move, uh, movement, uh, other individuals within the NSA, such as Bill Binney, um, who tried to create a program where the things that the NSA was intercepting would be encrypted as soon as they were intercepted. So the NSA could not read them. And the only people who could decrypt them were actually the courts. So the courts that issued the orders would then provide the NSA with the actual physical capability to read the interception as kind of a safeguard uh, that's superior to law. Um, and that's, that's the idea is, when institutions fail, when laws fail, natural laws persist. Uh, and technology is increasingly providing us for ability, the ability to encode our rights, not just into our laws, but into our systems. So when you know, the failure of black letters on a page becomes apparent, we still have the fail safe of our technological systems, the, the systems that we surround ourselves and rely upon every day. Uh, and I think that's a that's an issue that we will be confronting more and more in the future. So then, let's just think about though in th that in the context of the balance between surveillance and privacy. We talked a little bit about this when we uh, talked in advance of this conversation. Um, Binney's idea of imagining a technology that would protect the product of the surveillance, so that the root concern that many people have about mass surveillance, that you have government agents who are basically rooting around in people's private lives, would be removed again by technology, by cryptography. That wouldn't be possible. And so that this surveillance system that, were, that was designed the way you just described would produce a whole bunch of data that would only ever be usable if there were proper authorization to use it. But right, even it's that an enforcement idea, process. Yeah. But even that idea you have a concern about. You think that doesn't respect privacy enough. So what is the sense of privacy that's invaded if nobody can actually get access to the private data unless there really is a good, legitimate, personalized claim for why they should have access to it? Well, that, that's because, uh, at least in the United States, we have a fourth, uh, fourth Amendment prohibition, not just against unreasonable search, which is what Binning was protecting against, but also against unreasonable seizure in the first place. And that's what that system does not protect against. And this is a critical distinction that uh, is missed in much of the debate, uh, is that it's not simply a violation of the Fourth Amendment to search this information, but to seize it uh, without specific justification, without some sort of showing a probable cause to do so in the first place. Um, because what we're doing is we're uh, compiling what academics have referred to as a database of ruin. Um, when you collect everything on everyone, as a matter of course, uh, the, the um, temptation to abuse that database, uh, the temptation to access that information, to use it in new ways in response to new threats, um, particularly in secret, uh, is simply too great to be ignored. Uh, and this is, this is one of the reasons that we have the prohibition against unreasonable seizure. Uh, we don't say, you know, the police can go and search through all of our houses, uh, take everything that they want, um, but then simply not use it uh, or, you know, just make a note of everything that's in our house, but not take it um, because it's that uh, that reduction uh, in liberty, that reduction in our freedom, that reduction in our power relative to our state uh, that is the real concern. 
uh, because when we enable uh, a government, uh, an institution, a, uh, a state, uh, whether it's here or anywhere else in the world, to claim these incredible powers, um, even if they're being used uh, properly as a result of policy, we have to remember that policy is a very weak protection. Uh, and I believe the Supreme Court and Riley actually made a statement about this. Uh, I'll, I'll have to defer to members of the audience for the exact quote. Um, but uh, the idea is that we did not fight a revolution for the benefit of policy protections. We don't need to justify why we need our rights. I don't need to say why I had or why I need to be able to hide something. I don't need to say I have something to hide or I don't have something to hide. It's incumbent on the government to make a showing of why it has a not just a, a desire to, but a requirement to infringe upon our rights, infringe upon our uh, infringe upon our liberties, infringe upon our private domain uh, in order to sort through our things. And that matters whether it's our homes, that matters whether it's the content of our communications or the metadata, which is uh, you know all of our associations, our, our travels, uh, where we're at for how long and that sort of thing. Um, policy as a protection, we, we need to remember that policy is a one-way ratchet that only loosens over time. You know, the government never places additional restrictions on itself um, unprovoked. Uh, so we, we may have a public debate and say, all right, we've instituted this program. We'll seize the communications of everyone in the country. We'll seize the communications of everyone around the world, but we'll only search them upon these bases. Uh, but we're gonna compile this gigantic database that lasts for five years uh, based on current policy. Current policy for retention at NSA today is five years. Uh, and you can waive that to be longer. Um, but the question is, how do we know when that changes, particularly when it's classified, particularly when it's not being briefed to the majority of Congress, uh, and particularly when we look at things such as the intelligence committees uh, that receive twice as much, uh, twice as many campaign donations relative to the other members of Congress from intelligence contractors, from defense contractors, uh, we begin to see a sort of regulatory capture that excuses agencies, programs, and policies from accountability on a very large and alarming basis. Uh, and so for me, the way we prevent these abuses from occurring is we go, look, we have these rights for a reason. And if we are going to change the boundaries of our rights, that's a public decision. That's not a decision for some official sitting behind a closed door somewhere. Um, that's something that we have to arrive on. We have to have broad social approval of it. And we have to agree that these things are necessary. And that hasn't happened. Right. But if it happens in the way that you described, if you had this broad public conversation and the public basically said, well, we like the idea of being able to trace back to find the criminal, um, the terrorist or the criminal. We like that idea. But we also like Snowden's idea or Binney's idea that all of that data should be protected, not through policy, but through physics, through cryptography. Um, and so we created a process. Put the Fourth Amendment aside for a second because it turns out it's more complicated than, than this makes it sound, but just bracket it. There was a process that said we would encrypt and protect. So there's a database that you could only get access to if you could crack, and maybe you're the only person in the world who could crack it. Let's just assume that for a second. Um, you, you still seem to have some trouble with the idea of this data being out there, right. this retrospective data being out there. And what, independent of the Fourth Amendment or the framers, just right, what right, is right. the problem? What's the problem so with that? Ultimately, it comes down to it's a violation of our natural rights, right? These are inherent rights that cannot be voted away by the majority. I ex sort of explain and illustrate the concept previously because that's the government's uh, sort of claim. That's their position, and I want to be fair to it. But when I look at it, these are rights that are inherent to our nature. You know, the reason we have rights is their protection against the majority. It's to make sure that these kind of programs can't be voted in in a moment of panic uh, that will pass like it always does um, and revoke rights that are necessary, even if those rights are only valued by a small portion of society. Because when, when you live um, in a liberal society, uh, vice and authoritarian society, you have to have respect not only for the majority's wishes, but the minority's rights. Um, and, and so we talk about uh, why is it not okay to intercept everything, store it, as long as we're encrypting it and, and filtering it through in a, in a processed way. Um, 
first off, it's because it's not necessary. Um, in the wake of these programs, uh, the president appointed a panel of uh, friendlies, you know, people who are all incentivized to exonerate these programs. They had full access to classified information. Uh, and interestingly, they found that mass surveillance, particularly in the case of the 215 um, phone metadata programs, uh, although it actually collects more than just phone metadata, um, that authority had never stopped a single imminent attack in the United States. Uh, none of the information had been shown to have any unique and concrete value. And of the information that they did find, even if it was nice to have, uh, they found that it was available through other means, traditional means, such as corridors. And that's the real key. When I think about what I saw and what really alarmed me uh, during my time at the NSA and CIA, it was that we had pivoted. We had changed from focusing on traditional methods of surveillance, uh, which first off is not using uh, foreign intelligence capabilities for law enforcement means. And it's important to remember that terrorism is a law enforcement problem at its core. Um, is that, uh, sorry, I, uh, I, I got lost there. Could you remind me of what I just said? Yeah, you, you were describing the way in which um, this oh, Right, mass versus targeted surveillance. Right. That's what it was. I apologize. Uh, got a really poor working memory. Um, we have uh, the traditional methods of surveillance, which are targeted surveillance. And they are effective, and this is key, even when the target has incredible uh, security measures in place, even when they use encryption, whether that's transport level security, uh, i.e. the communication in transit, you know, who they're calling is protected. Uh, or whether it's data at rest encryption, which is, you know, the contents of their phone are protected. Uh, I, working at the NSA, when I was focusing on, on targeting Chinese hackers, um, would be able to hack hackers. You know, we would be able to penetrate their methods, and this is for everybody around the world, not just a hacker in this place or the other, uh, because systems are fundamentally insecure. And this is the same as law enforcement powers we've had for, for generations in taking down organized crime, uh, you know, the, the mob, uh, uh, domestic terrorists and things like that. You go to a judge and you say, we have probable cause to suspect that this person is involved in some kind of serious wrongdoing, some kind of criminal activity. Please allow us to exercise these lawful powers in pursuit of this target. And after the judge approves that, basically anything goes. I mean, the FBI hacks people now. They hack people. The FBI does it every day, even on Sundays. Uh, we get into their computers, and if they have encrypted, uh, encrypted material, we simply steal the key. Because the fundamental reality of encryption, uh, when we think about how this works, is the person who is using the encrypted data, right, if I encrypt something, I can't read it either unless the key is input at some point. You know, when you turn on your phone and you're looking at, uh, you know, if your phone is encrypted locally, and you're looking at pictures, you know, your selfies on it, if those selfies are visible to you, it's because they're being decrypted. Otherwise, it would look like white noise. It would look like garbage. Um, so what this means is that even heavily protected, heavily encrypted communications are vulnerable to traditional means of investigation. And this is what the real challenge uh, between what happened before and what's happening now is, and how we find our way out of this, and how we avoid the mass, you know, let's surveil entire populations, as opposed to targeted individuals, is um, rather than saying, let's monitor the communications of everyone in the United States, because we want to be able to do pre-criminal investigation. And that's an incredible departure from the traditional model, pre-criminal investigation, where we're doing retrospective searching into evidence that we collected against you before you did anything wrong, before you were suspected of any wrongdoing, you know, while you were just an innocent. And instead go, we suspect this person on the basis of this association, on the basis of this activity, on the basis of being, uh, you know, witnessed the scene of this crime, uh, we have probable cause for surveilling them specifically. And not only uh, is that effective, and we know it's effective because we do it every day, um, it's rights respecting because you've got the restraint of the courts, um, you have policy protections in place, and it's done on a basis that is necessary and proportionate to the threat that's being faced. Um, you know, it's not necessary, as we've seen from the White House's own review, to collect the communications of everyone in the country. This has been going on for more than a decade now. It's never stopped an attack. It's never been shown to be necessary. And yet we've been doing it. 
so the question is, do we need to continue to do that when it's not been shown to have value? We do know it has huge costs. And I, you know, there, there's no, um, no fundamental way to prove a negative or anything here. But uh, I would posit from my own experience using these tools, because I, I use mass surveillance tools in my work every day at the NSA in Hawaii, um, that we miss attacks, we miss leads, and investigations fail because when the government is doing what it's called a collect it all investigation, where we're you know watching everybody, we're not seeing anything with specificity because it's impossible to to keep an eye on all of your targets when you're constantly dumping more hay on top of them. A good example of this is actually the Boston Marathon bombings. Um, the Sarnayev brothers uh, were pointed out to us by the Russian intelligence services. The FBI was tipped off about that. Uh, they only performed a cursory investigation. And, you know, that's because of resource constraints and things like that. Uh, they said, you know, we didn't have enough to go after these guys all the way. But the reality is we knew who these guys were. We knew they were associated with extremism in advance of the attacks, but we didn't follow up. We didn't really watch these guys. And the question is why? And I believe the reality of that is because we do have finite resources. And the question is, should we be spending $10 billion a year on mass surveillance programs at the NSA um, to the extent that we no longer have effective means of traditional targeted surveillance? We're watching everybody that we have no reason to be watching simply because it may have value at the expense of being able to watch specific people for which we have a specific cause for investigating them. And that's something that we need to look carefully at how to balance. So one consequence of everything you've described is its effect on, the effect on privacy. Another consequence that you've talked about is the way in which the government's intervention into technologies and work with technology companies has rendered um, commercial entities more vulnerable, more vulnerable to international hacking themselves. I wonder, as you reflect on that, you know, to what extent do you think that's a significant concern that commercial interests ought to be bringing to the government as an independent reason to cut back on this kind of intervention? So the vulnerability of uh, systems and services to mass surveillance is a big thing. Um, it's a, a big danger competitively, uh, particularly if it is policy-based uh, as opposed to technologically-based, because if these authorities are being drawn from national laws, suddenly nobody trusts American products and services anymore. We have, you know, we have, uh, we have prison. We have basically backdoor authorities to go into Google and Facebook and Apple and so on and so forth under uh, the FISA Amendments 702 authority, which does not require a warrant, mind you. Um, and they can rifle through the communications of people using these services. Uh, why, why would an individual trust a bank that steals from them? Uh, similarly, why would anybody trust a phone that spies on them? If a German wants to buy a phone, are they gonna buy an American phone with a back door? Or are they going to buy a Korean phone that's surveillance free because they know that's a competitive advantage? Um, that's, that's something we need to be able to confront. More broadly, uh, how do we secure this? How do we make sure that our, our technical products and services are robust and resilient against government intrusions, not just from our own government, uh, because by and large, our government does uh, play by pretty decent rules. Um, but how do we protect them against adversaries? How do we protect them against the most authoritarian states in the world? And the only way to do that is to ensure that we fundamentally oppose any policies or any kind of uh, dictates that compromise the security of our devices, that compromise the security of our services. Um, it's, it's talked about recently, the government, the FBI is pursuing back doors into our, our personal devices. You know, they want to be able to spy on your phone as, as long as they say, you know, we've got a reason, we have some process that allow us to do it. But the reality is once you bake a back door into something, um, you can't control who walks through it. Uh, the NSA has done this for ages where we exploit back doors built into communications, built into systems by other countries for these same reasons. Uh, we do it for our own reasons. You know, the FBI builds back doors and for a lawful purpose, the uh, NSA uses them for foreign intelligence purposes, so on and so forth. And this is also, there's, this is not, um, this is not theoretical. These are things that have already happened. If you've got phones out there, um, you know, you can Google uh, the Athens affair, which is a wiretapping instance, uh, I believe, circa the, uh, the Greek Olympics, um, where basically the entire government of the country, their highest level officials, 
uh, were unlawfully wiretapped by unknown parties uh, using lawful intercept capabilities that were built into the telecommunications devices uh, in place at that country. And that's really the danger. Uh, by enabling this sort of surveillance, we're actually weakening the security for a massive factor uh, of, of individuals. We're, we're basically uh, compromising the security of society for the benefit of an agency. And you know there, there, there can be reasonable disagreement about where we draw the lines and where this should happen. But the real question is, you know, how many phones has the NSA or had the FBI seized that they were unable to break the encryption on? Uh, they actually provide uh, counts for these. I think there's one from a couple years back that shows they've only ever been unable to break uh, a couple phones, something like three or four, and it wasn't relevant to the case, uh, I think. Meanwhile, they seize tons of phones that are encrypted, uh, but they are able to get around. So really, is this the problem that it's claimed uh, compared to the, pr the uh, protection that encryption that, uh, that basically good cybersecurity practices provide to a society? If we have secure services, if we have secure products, and we have a national competitive advantage globally, uh, we have a robust and thriving technical sector um, that's providing jobs, it's providing taxes, it's providing economic growth, uh, that's creating a more enlightened society here. You know, we the tax revenues based on that can can result in a more fair, uh, more fair living condition for everyone within it. Uh, we are also safer. We have a better respect for our rights, and we're better protected against basic crimes. If you lose a phone, and that phone is not encrypted, whoever finds that phone now has access to everything in your life. Um, and that's not even talking about you know the NSA. That's not talking about intelligence agencies. That's just talking about the guy in the corner. If your phone is encrypted, that information still belongs to you. Uh, and that's really what we need to think about. Do we want to have control over our private lives? Do we want to have control over our associations, over our ideas, and over our effects? Or do we want to forego these things? Can we forego these things in response to a limited and transient threat? So when you came to the decision to become a whistleblower, Obviously, it wasn't a decision that you could have made in a single day. It must have been many months of coming around to the, to the conclusion that this is something you had to do. Just were there moments when you concluded it was wrong, you shouldn't do it, and, or you were afraid that if you did it, certain terrible things would happen? And, and what, were that, what was that reflection like? Uh, could this have gone in a really bad way that Obviously, you don't think it did, or are there things about it that happened that you really regret? So there, there is still an active and ongoing investigation into me uh, right now, so I'm kind of limited in what I can discuss with specificity. But I will say that, yeah, I, of course, I had second thoughts. I had doubts uh, because I really wanted to make sure my, my first principle for all of the journalists, for everybody involved in this, was we have to do no harm, right? We have to make sure that this serves the public interest. Um, because this is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary action. But when I had doubts, ultimately it came down to, is there a means through which the system can self-correct? And I came to the determination that that was, uh, that was not the case. Uh, whistleblowing is ultimately, it's, it's the last fail safe. It's the safety valve through which any organization or an institution can repair itself organically through its own personnel before it becomes a failed institution, before it becomes an illiberal institution. Um, and when I think about the way this, uh, this happened and how it shaped my own thinking, I looked back on the political offense and the, the health of the oversight, the health of the accountability to which the intelligence community and the, the National Security Agency specifically were being held. And I, I saw things like the, uh, the Supreme Court decision in Amnesty versus Clapper, where the ACLU argued that under the 702 Surveillance Authority, uh, the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, we were all being monitored. This kind of thing was happening. The Supreme Court rejected the lawsuit, not on the merits, but based on standing. They said that we could not prove that we were being watched. Uh, and on that basis, we, we couldn't challenge the policy that allowed us all to be watched. Um, beyond that, we had failures in Congress. The Director of National uh, Intelligence, James Clapper, under oath gave false, uh, false testimony 
to the uh, intelligence committees, which were charged with overseeing him and, and regulating the behavior of these things. Uh, Ron Wyden famously asked him, does the NSA collect any information at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And he said, no, uh, that was not true. And yet we didn't know about that as the public. There was no uh, correction even days after, even after he was informed that he provided false testimony. Uh, and he faced no consequence, which is very dangerous because people in the intelligence community um, at the senior level, at the uh, level of positional authority, the decision makers, they pay attention to these things and it creates an institutional culture. Um, you could argue it is corrupt, uh, not in a graft sense, but in a, uh, a sense of personality politics, people can make their own decisions that are untethered from public interest because they know they will not be held to account for it. Uh, that's dangerous. And ultimately, you know, we had the courts, we had Congress, we also had the executive. Uh, the president had campaigned to rein in these programs, uh, rein in these abuses, and I'm not putting it just on the president himself, but fundamentally, I think one of the most difficult consequences, legacy issues here, is that when we had evidence of criminal wrongdoing in a U.S. administration, no one was held to account for it on the basis that we should look forward and not backward. But all criminal activity, all criminal investigation, I'm sorry, uh, is retrospective. We have to look backwards if we're to hold anyone to account. Uh, and when that, when that doesn't happen, you know, we have a question of how does this impact the quality of our society? How does this affect the quality of our governance? And how does this affect our power as a public in relation to our government? And when I looked at these issues in aggregate, it seemed clear to me that this was not a, uh, this was not something that, uh, you know, I was making an extraordinary leap about. If it was not to be me, it would be someone else. Uh, if the government did not want uh, individuals such as myself to hold these ideas and to defend the Constitution against these kind of violations, they would not make us swear an oath to the Constitution. You know, when, when I took an oath at the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, that oath was to protect the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that's, that's important to remember because this is critical to the quality of our governance. If we only look outward, um, we have this sort of inevitable slide, this inevitable slow corrosion where generation after generation, we lose a little bit of the freedom, a little bit of the liberty that we inherited. So this kind of pushback, particularly when we try to do it carefully, particularly when we try to do it in a narrow way, uh, is not dangerous to society, but is in fact, I think, healthy for it. And I was one of the individuals who I believed had the, uh, had the visibility into where the problems lie by virtue of my position, by virtue of my experience, by virtue of my access uh, to raise these issues to public awareness. So I tried to do that in the most responsible way that circumstances would allow. So you, you've, um, you've obviously put yourself at great risk. Uh, you're in a very difficult situation right now. You're in Russia, I, I take it. That was never part of the plan um, to be right. stranded in Russia. Um, but as, as you think about civil disobedience and what, what the ethics of civil disobedience should be, is there a certain point at which it's appropriate to make yourself available to the ordinary criminal process? Um, I mean, we have, for example, my colleague Yochai Benkler believes, and I think this is right, there ought to be something like a public accountability defense to criminal prosecutions, where if what you've done is to whistleblow for the purpose of exactly as you've said, then you could be excused. But obviously, we don't have that in our law right now. So I wonder, as you think about it, I mean, it's been important that you've been outside of the control of the law for a period of time for the purpose of making, this, making us aware of this. But I wonder whether you struggle with what the long term for Edward Snowden is. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the ultimate... Uh question for me is, you know, have I done the right thing in the best way that I could? I'm never going to be perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, I'm only human. Um, I don't think I'm Superman. You know, I don't think I, I am infallible. Uh, and I'm sure I've made many mistakes. And I volunteered to go to prison for the government. Um, but, you know, they, they've dismissed that. They, they have their, uh, their own agenda as far as this is concerned. But, you know, I, I won't get too far into, uh, into the brass tacks of, you know, criminal negotiation and whatnot. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that for the lawyers in the room because I'm not a lawyer. 
Um, but the reality is, as you stated, there is no due process available for whistleblowers in the intelligence community today, uh, particularly uh, contractors as opposed to direct government employees. Uh, even the process protections, not statutory protections, uh, that uh, exist for people in the intelligence community or whistleblowers more broadly federally um, are very limited when they come to private contractors. In fact, they don't exist. Uh, we're exempted from those kind of protections. Uh, and when we talk about the law broadly, um, we see that the Espionage Act, which is intended for the prosecution of spies, is being increasingly leveraged uh, to be used as sort of a bludgeon against public interest journalistic sources and whistleblowers. And that's a real danger to society because as you said, there is no, you're banned, you're prohibited from making a public interest defense. You're banned from arguing to the jury that you tried to do these things for the right reasons, whether or not they agree. And when we think about the fact that we have closed court processes where they limit the arguments that you can make, you limit the kind of programs and uh, evidence that you can present to the jury as a defendant, uh, and you limit even the arguments that they can make for regarding what their motivations were, you have to go, is this still um, a, a law that is, again, consistent with not just our constitution and due process protections and the basic ideas of fairness and justice, um, but is it consistent with our values as a society? And is it consistent with our need for a free press? Because when anybody who acts as a journalistic source does so at, the, at their own peril of 10 years or more in prison, uh, what impact does that have on society? And uh, again, I don't want to presume to say where the law should be drawn because obviously I have, uh, I have a conflict of interest and biases uh, incumbent there. But I do think it's reasonable to say that there is no reason the defendants should be prohibited from making a public interest argument before a jury uh, when their actions were clearly intended uh, on the basis of serving the public interest. So, I'm grateful for the time you've given us. Um, I'm just gonna close with one last question from Mohib, uh, Mohib Asan. Hoodies or suits, Edward Snowden? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, have to, I have to say I love that person for asking. Uh, thank you very much because, you know, I'm, I'm not a commentator. I'm not a, uh, I, I'm not a talking head. I'm not a media guy. I'm not polished. I suck at this stuff, honestly. Uh, I am a hoodie guy. I wore hoodies at work at the NSA. <laughs> Uh, my lawyer and everybody around me advises me that I have to wear a suit just because it's what people do. Um, but yeah, you know, just, just for you, I'm getting rid of the suit because that's, uh, that's not me. But um, it's, uh, it's a hoodies, hoodies all the way thing. And I hope by the time I die and the next generation has inherited the earth, we don't even have suits anymore. They're just gone forever. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Edward Snowden for taking this time. Thank you very much.